Uh, morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Day to night out? <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Uh, who had trouble getting up this morning? Yeah, mm. me too. Take that um, data down. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to try and do our best to keep you all awake this morning. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is the Bayou Tapestry Mapping Threats to the Louisiana Coast. My name is Ashwin. This is Jim. Let's get started. This is southern Louisiana today. And what strikes you first is how much has already been lost. Much of what you see here used to be a dense wetland covered with trees and wildlife. But now, thanks to the salty waters of a rising tide, most of this has been rendered uninhabitable. And soon, within 10 to 15 years, much of what you see here will likely be underwater. In fact, according to the USGS, this part of the country loses about a football field's worth of land every 100 minutes. And overall, since 1932, this part of the country has lost over 2,000 square miles of land to the rising tides of the ocean. And this is becoming more and more important today as more and more people's lives are at stake. Take, for example, the town of Lafitte, which once sat safe, nestled far inland away from the dangerous ocean. But now, it finds itself next in its path. Looking at the screen over here, going from right to left, you can see the disastrous effects of the rising ocean as the salty waters penetrate the land, killing off the trees that once lived there. And if nothing is done soon, the several thousand inhabitants of Lafitte will be forced to uproot their lives and move up to the north. And the most striking part about all of this is that this is happening just south of here, barely 20 miles away. Hey everyone, my name is Ashwin Kumar, and I'm a product manager on the Tableau mapping team. And I'm Jim Walseth, I'm your dev on stage today. Um, I'm a senior software developer on the maps team. What I want to do uh, first and foremost is acknowledge uh, the article that inspired our work. Uh, this is a New York Times article that was done in conjunction with the Times Picayune, who are across the street, which is awesome. Uh, when I saw this article back in February, I already knew we were going to be in New Orleans, and I said to Ashwin, like, we've got to take this and tell this story in Tableau at conference. You know, I believe that the sweet, uh, cuisine of an area and its other uh, enjoyable things taste better when you're also aware of the bitter challenges that are faced by the communities around you. I think it's a richer experience, so I hope we're going to provide you with that. There is no part of this story which is not fascinating, I can tell you. It's pretty amazing. So um, I said we were going to tell the story in Tableau. That's what we're going to do in three workbooks. The first question we tried to answer is, well, uh, this is one way to make people aware of the situation in southern Louisiana. Another way uh, is with a workbook. So we're going to uh, show you that. How would you socialize this issue out into the world? Then we're going to ask, once imagine we've made people aware of that, the next question will be, OK, what are we going to do as a community uh, at, at large, on the large scale? And finally, we're going to drill into this town, Lafitte and talk about how they might use Tableau uh, to make very specific data-driven arguments about what infrastructure should be built uh, in their town. So with that, um, we'll just get going. Let's see. see if I can push the right button here. OK. So here we have uh, a very basic map. The orange uh, dots with the labels are communities in this area that were cited in this article as communities at risk uh, in Louisiana. And actually, this is not an alarming map, as you can see. Um, these towns are, are cited as they were in perfectly appropriate places. This is a story point presentation. So what you're seeing is the first story point. I kept New Orleans in there just for your, your reference. The next story point uh, says, it's a little bit hard to read, so I'll read it for you. Expected 100-year flood 50 years from now with no action. So I'm going to parse that out for you a little bit before uh, I go to that story point. The 100-year flood, you know, we all know it's kind of like the big one. But for planners, 
and modelers of climate and floods and things, this is a very specific thing. This is something that they uh, use in their analysis. It's a flood event inundation that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. Uh, so 50 years from now, why would that matter? Why would the 100-year flood be any different 50 years from now than it would be if it happened today? Well, uh, in southern Louisiana, it makes a big difference because there are known effects. The land is eroding and subsiding in some areas, and sea level is rising. So 50 years from now is a different scenario. Um, now, without action is very important to what I'm about to show you. It is not the intent of the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority who did all this modeling to take no action. The point is to take action. But in their model, they show what would happen if nothing is done. Want to see that again? I like to see it. Today, during the flood, 50 years from now. So you can see, clearly, um, some of these towns are in quite a bit of water. Anywhere you see the color that is the color of the ocean, which we have done intentionally for this effect with the background map, that's eight or more feet of water. And where you see uh, the blue fading out, that's shallower than that. And we'll talk about how we created this effect later, the second part of the program, or to go through how we created all these workbooks. So you'll find out. So that's kind of the drama of the situation. But I wanted to take a more uh, up close and personal view of these communities and see, well, one thing I wanted to do is gather more data. So here we have these sophisticated scientific models saying, here's how deep we think the water will be in these various places. But I wanted to know, and maybe you can help me decide how deep the locals think the water is going to be from these Google Street View images. So let's go to Ile St. Charles. And if you look at how that structure is built, perhaps you could help me estimate how deep they think the water is going to be at some point. Anybody care to take a guess? 15? Six feet? Let's take a look at some other communities, like Cocodri. I'd say that's getting up there, 12. Or Delacroix. I like this one particularly because you can really see right through it. Uh, so I think picture tells a thousand words or whatever. I don't, we don't know these people and we can't speak for them, but you know, it, for one thing, it does say, here's a measurable thing. This is what this person thinks they need to be prepared for. And the fact that they are preparing for it. Uh, moreover, I think the most important thing about these images is it says, these people in these communities are, you know, they're not leaving. This is a sign of resilience and a sign of communities that really, you know, they want to prepare and deal with what's coming. And they've been there for, I know communities of Jean Lafitte, there are people who have been there for seven, eight generations. So I think that's an important thing to know about the communities you're trying to help. That's what they're thinking about. So just in three story points, we told the story of uh, what may happen in southern Louisiana. This is a workbook that could be put out on Tableau Public, which we haven't done yet. But I always like to uh, take input. Maybe we'll push it out there during conference still. Another thing you could do is put this, uh, embed this in a, an online newspaper article, um, which is often done with workbooks like that. So this is how we can educate, socialize this important story. So that's our answer to the first question uh, of letting people know about the problem. So now let's imagine that we have done that and uh, governments of Louisiana and the United States realize we should take action. Remember. We want a future with action, not without action, right? So, so we set about, uh, uh, Ashwin and I, to, you know, how, how shall we do this analysis? How do we decide where, for instance, specifically, levees should be built? The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana, uh, who provided us with a lot of the data we're using, including this flood data, now that's their charter. So we thought, well, let's see if we can decide what work they should do. So the first thing we thought of is like, well, you want to put the protection where most of the people are. That would be most effective. But actually, if you look at, 
we'll just go back to this picture momentarily. New Orleans is not threatened. In New Orleans, where most of the people are, but it's actually quite well protected now. It's got you know, good, good structures. So that is not the most logical place to put all your effort. So then you think, well, OK, it's about water and how deep the flood is. You go to the places where the water's deepest, like 40 feet, there are places where the water's that deep. Maybe that's where the effort should be put. But actually, when you go to those places, there's no people there, or very few. So what we really need is the intersection of those two things, places with lots of people, structures that would be damaged, and water. And to do this intersection, we used a new feature in Tableau called spatial join. This flood data that we got from the CPRA is polygons, and we found uh, data for buildings. And we intersected those so that we could get the property. How deep is the water at every single building in southern Louisiana? Now, that's, you know, if you count those buildings, it's over 500,000 buildings. And when you plot 500,000 buildings in Tableau, if you haven't done that yet, what you see is a mass of points. And it's, you can't really draw any conclusions from that. So we then applied another new feature in Tableau called the density mark type. And we produced what we feel is a good representation of where the work should be done in Louisiana. And then we took the Coastal Protection and Restorations Authority's planned projects and we overlaid it in a dual axis map to show whether they correlate. So I'm now gonna take you to that workbook having described what it's all about. So here we have it. Where you see dense blue areas, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is the intersection of lots of water and lots of structures. And where you see the red lines, those are the levee structures that the CPRA has planned and are actually constructing. And uh, great correlation between our analysis um, of the town of Hauma and the Bayou Lafourche, which is that long thing sticking out with the red line around it. Uh, so actually, this is pretty great. I mean, we're not exactly checking their work. Maybe uh, they're checking our work. But it's an independent kind of verification that the work is being done in the right place. Um, remarkably, this morning, uh, when I was looking up one of the reporters who worked on this story locally, I found an article from yesterday saying that the federal government is going to accelerate their work on the Morganza to the Gulf project, which is that long one that scoops around the bottom of the bio. So perhaps, Ashwin, they saw our workbook. I don't know. But you know, maybe the word is out. I'd like uh, to think so. I'd like to think so. So anyway, um, so this is, you know, I think, helpful. This is the kind of thing you can do in Tableau. Um, and you should give it a try. The only problem here is if you're not in one of these levy protected areas as planned, you may feel somewhat left out. And uh, particularly, uh, I'm going to focus on, you can sort of see this area in here does not have any protection planned. And right here is the town of Lafitte. And so this brings us to the third question. If you're the town of Lafitte, um, how do you make an economic argument to have maybe a levee built around your town. Um, well, let's use Tableau. And with that, I'll let Ashwin represent the town of Lafitte and cool. make an argument. Thanks, yeah. Jim. Yeah. So we're going to focus on this area of the map right here, which is that town of Lafitte that I mentioned in the intro of this presentation. So when I was researching this town, uh, the first place that I wanted to start was about six years in the past. And I made a workbook here to model the CPRA's 2012 plan to build a levee around this town of Lafitte. And what I found was that in the 2012 plan, there actually was a levee planned to be built around the town. That's the orange line that we see here. However, or, and, and with this model, right, if this levee were to be built, we can see that in the event of that disastrous 100-year flood that Jim was talking about, this town is actually going to be protected. So that's great news if you live in Lafitte. However, as Jim just shared, in the latest model, 
this town does not have a levy proposed to be built around it. In the event of that flood, here is what the models say this area would look like. So if you live in Lafitte, this is a problem, right? Everything here is underwater. So now imagine if you know, we all work for the town of Lafitte, and we want to start telling a story, or making an argument to the CPRA to explain why our town should get that funding to build this levy. Well, one place to start could be with the numbers, with the economics of the situation. So what Jim and I did is we built another dashboard. And this one has two parts to it. On the left side is a bar chart that shows the approximate dollar value of all the structures in the town. And on the right side is, again, that view of the map that has the proposed 2012 levy plans. And one cool thing that I can do with this map is I can select different parts of the town. And I can see the approximated dollar value of the selection that I made. In this case, I happen to have select about, selected about $100 million worth of structures out of the total $400 million. Now, what can we do this, with this information? Well, maybe I could tell a story of, you know, maybe we can't get the full funding to build the entire levy around the town, but what if there were certain parts that we really wanted to protect and we, we could pull all of our citizens back in those parts of the town? Or imagine if I had population data of each building in the town and I could see where the most people were living and try and protect those areas. I don't know, but the point is, with this kind of analysis, we're now equipped to ask more questions, ask for more details, and maybe make an argument for our own self-preservation. Okay, so that kind of concludes the first part of our talk. Um, in summary, what we've done is kind of give a big picture view of what's happening with the floods. The second workbook was where might we want to allocate our resources, and this one is talking about the specific town of Lafitte, and how it might be impacted and how they might make an argument for their own preservation. In the second half of this talk, we're gonna walk through each of these three workbooks and describe exactly how we built them. Overall, in summary, there's basically kind of two steps. The first step is data sourcing and data prep, and the second step is the actual uh, creation of the dashboards in Tableau. So we're gonna kind of go back and forth on that and show how it's done. Jim? Sounds good. Yeah, I'll take the role, and actually this is, I think, often in organizations how this might work out. Um, to create some of these maps, you might need someone who can do at least a little bit of geographic or GIS kind of work and uh, to get the data ready. So I'm going to talk about how we did that. Oh, I like that. Okay. Uh, so going back to the first workbook, remember it was just uh, cities on the map, and uh, briefly very uh, high-level summary of how the architecture of maps in Tableau. There is always a layer, which is your marks, which is, in this case, the points. Uh, and then in the background is a, uh, well, a background map, a static map, which is there for context. And this was a great illustration of that. Uh, the context, the floods, was a static map, a custom map map that I made. So, but the data, the data in the marks is actually quite simple. I, again, this, these towns cited in the article, um, they're too small of towns to be in our geocoding database. So if you just created uh, a spreadsheet and just put city and state on there, only a couple of these would show up. So I simply looked them up. I went into like Wikipedia, found these places and got their latitude longitudes and put them in this column. Uh, so it's just a manual process, finding the latitude and longitude. Same thing with the uh, Google Street View. I went to those towns in Google Maps, found the view that I wanted, and used a kind of hidden feature in Google that allows you to uh, share that very specific view. Uh, and that's what these funny looking things on the right are. Uh, and I just made another column with that. So uh, just a very simple, manually created uh, uh, data set. So the background map, uh, was a map box, a custom map box map. And uh, I gave um, this process, I actually gave a talk uh, Tuesday called In the Studio with Map Box, in which uh, I went through in quite a bit of detail how I created these maps. Uh, I'm not going to do that today, but you can download my PowerPoint from that talk, and it has every step that I took to make it. So this is going to be just kind of a high overview of what I did. Um, First, uh, I had to source the data for the floodplain. 
Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, I have to applaud them for the quality of their data. It's availability, very simple. I highlighted this download button. How did I get all that floodplain data? I went to this website and I clicked download. And the, the very well curated uh, data, um, uh, really, uh, it's a, it's a de democratization of data. You can go and get data like this, the data that they use to make their plan. So you could do what we did. Uh, they even have the, the 2012 data. So you can go back to 2012 as we did in Lafitte and, uh, and look at that. So I downloaded it. It was a shape file. Um, and what I did was upload uh, that shape file through some steps into our Mapbox account. When you upload data into Mapbox, it creates a tile set. Uh, maps come in tiles. That's why the squares you see when maps are coming in in the background. Uh, and what I have here, there's uh, up at the top, I'm sorry about the unreadable code words, but <laughs> one of these uh, tile sets is the boundary of the state that I brought in, and down at the bottom is the master plan 2017 flood depths. Once you have tile sets in Mapbox, uh, you can style them. Now, there's a lot going on here. I'll just, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a picture of how you go about making um, maps in Mapbox, customize them. Very briefly, on the left are all the uh, layers. Uh, the one that's highlighted on the left are my floodplain depths. In the middle of the image, I am styling that data. Uh, actually, I'm styling the opacity or transparency. And that little line you see going up and across, that little graph, is how I am telling Mapbox to paint that data. I already made it the color of water so it would match the ocean. And now I'm saying make the opacity zero when the water depth is zero. What that does is basically make these polygons disappear when the water depth is zero, which makes sense. This creates the effect, right? Um, and, uh, I, but I thought I made an arbitrary decision that when it got to eight feet that it should be completely blue. And so that's what that little ramp shows is the map box when it sends the tiles to be in our background map will make the areas that are eight feet or deeper solid blue. So this is the, um, so once I created these maps, you can publish them and they become, a, there's a few steps, that, again, it's in my talk, that make them available in Tableau to use. And so that's what, that's what was needed to make this first workbook just the points and the background map. So Ashwin's going to um, show you how to use those to build the workbook. Yep, so luckily for me, uh, Jim was awesome with data prep and he made my job as the analyst honestly super easy, right? So to build this first uh, sheet that we see here, it's kind of just two basic parts. The foreground, which is all of those cities, and the background, which is that colorful map that you see there. Let's make this map. So I'm gonna go to the bottom of the screen I'm gonna click the new worksheet button, and that does exactly what it sounds like. It makes a new worksheet. And the first step we're gonna to wanna to do is build that foreground, is put all those cities onto the map. And that's super easy. We'll go to the bottom left part of the screen where it says measures, and double click latitude and longitude. So what has just happened here is Tableau has gone into the custom Excel sheet that Jim made and pulled out all those latitude longitude pairs and put them on the map. But this isn't quite right, right? This is showing all the points in one average point, which isn't what we want. We want to see all the points separated. All we got to do is tell Tableau that's what we want. We'll go to the top left part of the screen where it says dimensions and take city, which is the city name, and bring that onto detail in the marks card. So now Tableau has split apart all the different cities into well, each city. And then personally, I'm not too familiar with the geography of this part of the country. So I'm just gonna take that city pill once again from the top left part of the screen, and I'll put that onto the label. So now I've labeled all the cities in the data set. Now I think we can go on to the background map. So as Jim mentioned, he built this custom background style in this third party tool called Mapbox. And luckily for us, Tableau and Mapbox have a great integration and a great partnership so what I can do is from the Mapbox account, I can copy and paste a simple URL and bring that into Tableau. The way I do that is I go to Map at the top of the screen, Background Maps, oh, Background Maps, and I would go into Map Services, and there's a place there where I can just copy and paste that URL. 
Now, I'm not going to do that today because Jim and I have already done that. But what I'll find is once I paste that URL into Tableau, I will see the title of that map appear in this menu. In this case, we're building the, the viz that shows ta uh, Louisiana now. So I'll click the now style. And that's going to load in immediately. Now, these cities are kind of hard to see, so I can change that. I'll make the color by going to the marks card orange. And then I'll make those dots just a little bit bigger. So I'll go to size, which is right next to it in the marks card. And I'll drag the slider a bit to the right. OK. Now, the last step when you're making a worksheet is to always name it with a good name. Um, it really helps with communication. So I'm going to go to the bottom of the view here where it says Sheet 3. And I'll right click that. And I'll go to Rename. And I'll call it Now. Cool. So that's that first view in just a few minutes. Now, going back to the story point, the second view is that same set of cities in the foreground with a different background map. Let's build it. So luckily for us, again, because we're using the same set of cities, I don't want to have to go through and double click latitude, longitude. Like I've already done that once. Luckily, I don't have to do it. I can go down to that now sheet that we just made and right click it and go to duplicate. And Tableau is going to make an exact copy of that worksheet. Now all I got to do is swap out that background map. And again, that was a custom Mapbox map that Jim brought into Tableau with the same URL uh, copy-paste action. So if I go to the top of the screen and just click Map, Background Maps, I can see that this map is already here waiting for me to use. So I'll click it and just swap it out. And then again, like before, it's best practice to rename that sheet to something useful. So in this case, I'll call it future. OK, we're almost done. The third story point that we wanted to make was this kind of coordinated dashboard. Right? It's got the map on the left side and the Google Street View on the right side. How do we do that? Well, Tableau has this awesome feature called Dashboard Actions, which let you connect any of your workbooks to the outside world and the internet. So building that is, again, Super easy, it's just a few clicks. I'll go to the bottom of the screen, and this time, instead of clicking New Worksheet, I'll click New Dashboard. And then here, as we saw before, we want to have that map on the left and Google Street View on the right. So we'll just kind of build that framework right now. I'll take my Now Sheet from the left side of the screen and pull it onto the dashboard. And I'll go to the bottom left part of the view, where it says Objects. And I'll pull out a web page object. I'll put it on the right side of the view. We can see here, before I let go of the clicker, that the right side is kind of shaded in gray. This tells you where Tableau is going to place the object for you. So I'll do that. And I'll make the edit URL reference the sheet name and hit OK. One more thing I can do is I can change the size of the screen to be automatic so that it fills up the entire view. The next step here is going to be to connect these workbooks together and connect the web page object to the actual internet, in this case, Google Street View. And the way you do that, the way you use any action in Tableau, is you need to have the specific field that you want to reference somewhere on the view. In this case, that means I want to have that Street View URL somewhere on my map view. But the thing is, I don't want to have a big URL obscuring my, my map. I like the map the way it looks. So the way that I get that onto the view without actually putting it on the view is I go to the top left part of the screen to Street View, which again is that URL, that Google URL, and I drag that to Detail. So what that's done is it's put that URL on the view without actually putting it on the view. So now if I go back to the dashboard that I just made, I'm ready to connect these two parts of the screen together. To do that, I'll go to the top part of the screen and click Dashboard. And I'll find the Actions button. And I'll select it. I will add an action, go to URL. Now here, this kind of looks intimidating, but it's really not. Uh, the top part of the screen here says Source Sheets. And this is where I want the click action to originate. 
In this case, there's only one map. It's the now map, so that part looks okay. And I want it to happen whenever I select a mark. And whenever I select a mark, I want Tableau to execute that URL action. And I want it to go to the street view. And I'm done. So now, if I click any one of these cities in my view, Tableau knows exactly which Google URL to execute to get that image from the internet. Now the last step here is going to be to put all these together in a nice, neat story point so that it's easy to communicate. To do that, I'll go to the bottom of the screen, and instead of clicking New Worksheet or New Dashboard, I'll click New Story. That's the one that looks like a book, if you can see it. And then this part is just simple drag and drop. I'll just take each of the worksheets that I built and drag them onto the view. I'll click blank to make a new story point, drag on the future, and I'll do it one more time for my dashboard. Now there's more that I could do here to make it look a little bit better. I can make it fill up the entire view. I can remove that title. I can add more details to my captions. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that right now. Instead, I'll pass it back to Jim to talk about data prep for the second workbook. Awesome. Oh, nice, nice work, Ashwin. Nice authoring. Let's see. Oh, gotcha. Did you find that guy? All right. Uh, yeah, so remember that we went from uh, telling the story in a big picture way, dramatic, to doing actual analysis. And what we had decided was we needed to find the intersection of water and people, or structures, actually. So um, we already had the floodplain data, so we had the water, but where are we going to get these buildings? And turns out that just recently, Microsoft released publicly this project that used aerial imagery to generate building footprints in the entire United States through an automatic process. So uh, this was perfect for us. Uh, I'll use another fact. A few weeks after um, we started using this data, the New York Times produced this uh, print, special print uh, issue that showed entire uh, communities like all of California every building that exists there. So uh, we did it first. That's all I'm saying. Uh, um, so, so this is great. Uh, we, have, we have these buildings. And again, this is raw spatial data. There's absolutely no properties associated with these buildings, except where you know, the, they're corners, right? Uh, so the steps we took, we knew we had to uh, do an intersection of points with our floodplain polygon. Point to polygon, that's how our spatial join works. So there are a few problems with this. It was great. We got this data set, downloaded it. Uh, a few problems. Number one, Louisiana alone, the building's uh, footprint's size is 500 megabytes. So this is going to, you know, many, many programs will choke or be difficult to work with. You'll, you know, if you loaded all this into Tableau and you tried to move the map, it'd be like, like this, right? So, Right. Also, we don't need all those things in, in northern Louisiana. So that was an issue. We needed to trim it down. And also, we need points. And how am I going to do that? Well, what I decided to do was first load the data into SQL Server. SQL Server because we have a connection. Tableau can connect to SQL Server and get spatial data out. That is the one database right now that we can connect to that has spatial connection. We are adding more. So um, like Postgres, things like that. But right now, so I use this command, which you don't need to like uh, um, remember or parse out right now. You can download this workbook and look at exactly what I did. But I highlighted this uh, last part of this uh, command that I used that clipped the data to southern Louisiana. So again, it's like I needed to reduce this data down. So we did that. Once the data was in SQL Server, um, I used a feature of Tableau called Custom SQL. And I am not uh, a SQL person. You know, uh, I just figured this out by looking up what I needed to do. But mostly um, what are here is you know, these, um, I, I queried for these columns of data that I wanted to use. I highlighted the envelope center. This is a spatial operation that SQL Server knows how to do. It knows how to take a polygon and take the envelope of the polygon and find the center. And that gave us the point, and that was very important. I really just wanted a point for every building. Uh, 
I also found that there were other things I needed to do, which fortunately there were also spatial commands for. Some of the polygons, these are you know, computer generated, and a few of them were like wrong, or had little self intersections, we call them, and things like that. So on every one of those, I asked a SQL server to do make valid, which you'll see uh, in that command. And then I found that the polygons were, uh, their order of points was reversed from what we understand the correct order to be, so that every building was not a building, but a huge sheet of the entire Earth with a building-shaped hole in it. So that was not going to work. So I did what's called reorient objects. So all this, I leveraged the power of the spatial operations that are in SQL Server, which you can also do uh, with custom SQL. Um, so I did a little bit more. Uh, in order to get the uh, levies that you saw, the CPRA projects, I had to bring in their data as well. And you'll see kind of in the middle of this is a union. So I've got both tables, the one with the points in it and the one with the lines. This is how we, uh, together. Uh, and you can see I then did two joins to that data after it came back from the custom SQL. One is the spatial join, and this is the magic. This is how we got water and structures together. Um, there's no way I could join those buildings any other way. They had no properties. All they had was a location. And that's where uh, Spatial join comes, comes into play. And again, it's not just, I just didn't want to know, is this point in this polygon? I wanted to give the properties of the flood to the point. And that's what we accomplished here. So we knew at every point how deep the water was. Um, and then I just did what I guess I call regular join to bring in uh, more data from the CPRA, the, state, the status of the levees and things like that. So. That's the next thing. OK, so <clears throat> that was the data prep for uh, the, the density mark type. And Ashwin, take it away. Cool. So Jim is my guy, because he is making my job super easy. We're going to build this map view right now. And just as a summary of what this is, it's a heat map of the building footprints and the water depths that are intersected, layered behind all the proposed levy plans from the CPRA's 20, uh, this might be the 2017 plans. Let's build it. So again, I'm gonna go to the bottom of the screen and I'll click New Sheet. And remember, we, we wanna make that kind of layered map view, right? So in Tableau, we'll just build those one layer at a time. So first, if we go to the left side of the screen, we can see the results of the custom SQL query that Jim just showed you. They're right here in the data pane. In this case, I happen to know that line geom represents the levy lines that we saw on the previous map view. So I'll just double click that field. And Tableau knows to automatically make a map. It knows that this is a spatial file type. Cool. And then again, one thing that we saw in the previous map view is we had each of these levies color coded based off of the building phase that it was in. To do that, it's super easy. I'll go to the top left part of the screen where I see phase, and I'll just drag that onto color. So now the view is color coded according to how the levy is progressing. And we're actually done with one of those layers. Now let's build that heat map layer. To build a layered map in Tableau, the first step is to go up here to the rows column and copy this latitude pill. Now on the Mac, I'm gonna hold down on command and I'll just drag this pill to the right that's kind of a shortcut to copying things in Tableau. On Windows, it's Control. We can see here in the Marks card on the left side of the screen, something looks a bit different. We now have one Marks card that controls all of the layers, and we have individual cards that control each of the other two layers. In this case, I can just pick one of my layers, and I can remove the lines and the phases from that map view. So we can see the top map is now empty. Now what I can do is bring in all of those points that represent the building footprints and the water depths. Here on the left side in the custom SQL query, Jim has called those point geom. So I can double click that. And what Tableau is gonna do, it's gonna take a few minutes, a few seconds here to render several hundred thousand points that is calculated ahead of time with that spatial join feature. Now, 
this kind of this thing isn't really making a lot of sense for me right now. Um, as Jim mentioned, we want to use that density mark type feature to make more sense of this very dense data. To do that, we'll go to the drop down where it says automatic right now. And I'll choose the bottom option, which is density. OK, so we're kind of getting somewhere, but this still isn't right. We only got that one dot right there, which isn't what we want. Well, what Tableau has done is it's aggregated all of the marks into one point. All I want to do is tell Tableau to break those points all apart. To do that, I'll go to the top of the screen, where it says Analysis, and I'll uncheck Aggregate Measures. So now Tableau is going to break apart that heat map into all the individual points in the top of the view. Now finally, the last step is to color code this density mark type according to the flood models from the CPRA. To do that, I'll go back to my data pane in the measures portion, the bottom left part of the screen. And what we can see here is we have a bunch of different models from the CPRA. Each one of these, you know, FWOA, low, medium, high, represents a different flood scenario. In this case, we'll choose the medium flood scenario, which is FWOA medium 7. And I'll drag that onto color. And we'll let Tableau do all the heavy lifting. So now, we have made our two different layers, and all we have to do is put them on top of each other. In Tableau, that layering action is called a dual axis map. And to access that capability, we'll go up here to the rows shelf, to this latitude pill that we copied from earlier. We'll click the drop down and click dual axis. And now Tableau is going to layer these two maps on top of each other, putting the levees on top of the heat map, showing us that the CPRA's proposed levees uh, are covering some of the darkest parts of the map, but again, are leaving other portions unprotected. And that's the view. Jim, got more awesome. for us? Nice work, Ashwin. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I learned so much preparing the data for that workbook that the last one was like quite a bit easier. Um, all I had to do was take that same building data, which I already put in the SQL database, and I used the uh, known geometry of the proposed levy from 2012 to clip that data, so I only had buildings in Gene Lafitte. So this is another custom SQL command, uh, kind of like uh, eye chart thing here, but basically uh, that is another operation I leveraged in SQL Server, and other than that, there are several other background maps that I created in, in Mapbox and uh, you know, through the same process. So some different background maps and buildings. That's it. That's all he needs. OK. So let's go back to Tableau. Um, here we have another story point uh, map view. But we already know how to build this, um, so I'm not going to go through that process again. What I actually want to show off is this other dashboard that we made. Remember, this one has the connected view where when I select buildings on the right side, it drives analysis to the bar chart on the left side. This uses a new feature that I'm sure you've all heard about by now in 2018.3 called Set Actions that lets you drive visual analysis via selection from one, from one worksheet to another. Again, let's build this view. So this view has uh, two different worksheets in it. It's got the bar chart on the left and the map on the right. So we're going to build it in those two steps. Again, we'll go to the bottom of the screen, and we'll click New Worksheet. And here, on the left side, in the Measures pane, we have Value of Structures. And this represents that dollar value of the building structures in the town. I'll double click it. And Tableau knows that I want a bar chart. So Tableau makes me a bar chart. And this one's kind of done for now. Next, we'll make a new worksheet. And again, we'll bring in that map view. Now here, we're going to want to bring in the geom field, which is going to be all those individual building footprints that Jim just showed you how he got. So I'll double click geom to put them on a map. OK, so this is kind of cool. Um, but again, we want to use that more colorful and detailed background map. So we're going to do that. We'll go to the top, click map, background maps. And luckily for me again, Jim has already brought in that map box map into Tableau. So I'll just click the right style 
In this case, it's Lafitte Ring Levy. And the background's gonna change. Now, a couple more key things that we wanna notice here. In this map, if I hover over these building footprints that look kinda small right now, I can't actually select them individually. That's because Tableau doesn't know yet to treat them as individual buildings. To tell Tableau to do that, I can take the ID field from the top left corner of the screen and drag that to detail. And that's gonna break apart these buildings, each one into an individual building. Okay, so now we've built the two individual views, but now we wanna connect them together with the set actions feature. This thing is brand new in Tableau 2018.3. The way you do that is, well, you gotta create a set, right? And we need to pick a field on which to create that set. Now in this case, buildings uh, in this view are you know, represented as two-dimensional structures. So we're gonna use the area of the building as the driver of our set. To do that, we'll go to the top left part of the screen here and take the area pill and put that onto detail. Again, the purpose of this is we know that to use actions in Tableau, the right value has to be on the viz somewhere. And here we want the area to be in the background of my viz. Now, we'll go back to my bar chart here, and we'll actually make that set out of the area field. So I'll go to the area pill in the top left corner of the screen and hit the drop down. I'll go to create, set. And here I can call it, I don't know, area set. And I can make sure that all the different building areas are included in the set. And I'll click OK. Now we also know that we used that feature before when you select a, build, a set of buildings, the bar chart changes color, so this set should be on the color field. So we'll put that on there. We'll drag area set and stick it on color in the marks card. Now finally, let's stitch it all together and make sure that you can drive actions from the map to the bar chart. We'll go to the bottom of the screen and open up a new dashboard, and then we'll drag on the two sheets that we just made. Sheet five, which is gonna be that bar chart, and sheet six, which is that map. And again, I'm gonna customize this view just a little bit more to make it look a little bit better. Cool. Now this bar looks kind of wide, so I'll make it a little bit smaller so we have more space for the map. Now let's make that dashboard action to connect these views together. Top of the screen, dashboard, actions, add action, and here's the part that's new. Change set values is a brand new option in Tableau. I'll click on it. And then again, it's a similar view to what we saw before. The top of the view is the source sheet. In this case, the source is the map or sheet six. So I'll make sure that sheet six is selected in the source. I'll make it a selection action. And then here, I'll specify the target set that I want to drive my analysis. And I'll click OK. So now if I did this right, what we should see is when I select a subset of buildings in the map, we should again see that bar chart change color depending on how much I selected. Let's see if that worked. It kind of worked. It kind of didn't. That bar chart looks a little bit off. The colors are backwards. Right? We, we expect to see blue as our selection and gray as we don't select. So let's go ahead and fix that. We can go back to our bar chart and simply change the color ordering. So now, in our dashboard, the blue is our selected area, and the gray is what's unselected. And again, this is a feature called set actions that lets you drive analysis via selection between different views. Okay, so we're almost there. Um, overall, as Jim mentioned, this isn't really meant to be a story of doom and gloom, right? And it's not meant to be any kind of political statement for or against any kind of government entity. Um, rather, what we wanted to do was show you all that not just the big companies, but also small communities and people, right, like you, me, and Jim, can use Tableau data and teamwork to tell the stories that matter. And that's our challenge for you today. You know, find those stories that matter to you, find the data, and make it happen. And when you do, please send it our way, because we'd honestly love to see it. That's right. Thanks, everyone. Um, feel free to come up and ask questions about maps. Uh, if you don't get a chance or you think of something later, 
uh, come to the analytics kiosk in the data village and the, you know, that's where I'm mostly hanging out, talk to people about maps and stuff like that. So uh, thanks very much for coming. Appreciate you being here. Awesome. Yeah.